Thank you very much. Uh, some prefacing remarks. Um, I aspire to be Mr. Harris over there. Uh, that sounds like just about the best job out there. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, speaking about investment and reporting and governance after that feels a little bit dry, to be honest. Um, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation and note that we conduct our business today on their traditional home. Uh, also to note that uh, this is land unceded by treaty, so we are in fact on their land. Um, I would also like to congratulate Iska uh, as a, an extremely privileged white man. Uh, I'm very seldom in the minority, but I would like to note today that we have had and will have once Emka's done, four of our, out of our six morning speakers are extraordinarily talented engineering women. And so Iska, very, very well done. That's a step in the right direction and, and duly acknowledged. So perhaps a round of applause for that. Um, I would like to ask, uh, hands up if you've got superannuation. Um, hands up if you work on projects. Uh, hands up if those projects require finance. Are we sure? Are we quite certain? Okay, so, so relevance. So we've really established relevance here. There is a very personal connection, uh, a professional connection, and an industry connection between the way that we build, uh, what we build, and how, in fact, we get over the hurdles and make sure that we can pay for those things. And that's really what today is about. Uh, I'm going to give some, some broad remarks around uh, the context of um, assurance for infrastructure investment, um, particularly thinking about Australia. And Emco will come up and speak very specifically around the GRESB survey and some of the excellent work that's been done globally. Um, because we've heard many times today, and we hear it at, at, at most conferences now, uh, cities are both our biggest challenge and our biggest answer. Um, they are the thing they where all the creatives want to be. Uh, they also super generate things like carbon emissions. So uh, big, big problems, really big solutions. Um, from an infrastructure perspective, the, the accelerating rate of urbanization also presents some Challenges that I would say are unique to the 21st century. They're not challenges we've really had to deal with before. Because we're now putting, oh, it is a bit of a delay, isn't it? Um, we're now having to put our major infrastructure assets, and infrastructure assets are impactful things. They're big. Uh, when you build a bridge, or you build a rail line, or you put in a new power line, uh, the local impacts during construction are substantial. There are practical impacts on local communities. And now we are. Uh, putting these things into our cities, because we are having to rethink the urban form. We're having to densify, we're having to redevelop, we're having to retrofit transit infrastructure into our cities, and so we are putting big projects close to people. Uh, and this has some undesirable outcomes, and so at the moment, social license is actually a material risk for infrastructure projects. And I'm going to speak a little bit about how sustainability and a framework for sustainability might be one of the arrows we have in our quiver to address some issues of social license. Uh, but social license requires it to be plausible. You actually have to have, uh, people have to believe you when you say you're doing good stuff. Um, so, one of the things about our cities and putting infrastructure into our cities is the complexity of the challenge. Because when you're putting, uh, rural infrastructure or you're putting something very remote, your impacts are, are quite easily understood because, I mean, your ecological impacts might be quite substantial, but certainly your social impacts are, are relatively easily understood. Whereas we are now putting infrastructure into communities where they're interfacing with our urban biodiversity systems, they're interfacing with our urban communities and they're interfacing with our urban built environment. And this introduces a level of complexity to the delivery of infrastructure in terms of its externalities, that lovely word that tends to be the catch-all for sustainability, all of the things that we should measure um, that we often don't measure. Uh, and these are often impacts in ways that we would never have predicted. Um, and if you're investing in that, uh, we need to think about what does that impact mean and how do we assess that impact over the full life cycle of projects. Um, we're entering a space where the design life for the projects we're working on is well within the climate change scenarios that are coming out of the IPCC 5. 
So we are seeing real impacts and incredibly high likelihoods of real risk around the dollars that underpin your superannuation investments, to put it very, very simply. And yet we do not have a reliable agreed framework for how to assess the non-financial impacts of that. We don't have uh, a standard approach to our non-financial accounting uh, for how those projects are administered. We take the financial side incredibly seriously indeed. If you look out the door across at Barangaroo, you'll see some names on the top of some buildings. You'll see PwC and KPMG. And uh, I don't think you'll find too many uh, companies that have specialized their core business in the assurance of non-financial performance. And yet we're entering the territory where a huge sector of our investment is sitting with material risk to these non-financial factors. And so to me, and I mean, I'm just a sustainability consultant, but uh, when I look at that, I see a second layer of risk, almost like a meta risk, which is the meta risk of not really recognizing the level of risk that is attendant to our investments. And I see ISCA and the IS rating tool and GRESB together as critical parts of our global infrastructure for delivering reliable information on how we manage complex risks across the life cycle, as well as underpinning the financial performance of assets across their life cycle. So I'm going to speak to three things today, uh, very briefly. I'm going to speak to the question of risk. I'm going to speak to the question of efficiency. And I'm going to speak to the question of governance and reporting uh, quite briefly. Um, I would also like to note this is uh, based on a paper we've done in conjunction with both ISCA and GRESB. Um, we're members of ISCA and we're global partners with GRESB, and that will be published uh, probably in early November. So this is a bit of a sneak peek of that. But essentially, it's looking at how we develop the value proposition for informed investment in infrastructure. Um, so we've mentioned climate risk. and. It's, it's the most obvious one, but I, I mean, I still struggle personally with an intuitive understanding of what this actually means. I mean, we've seen in South Australia recently uh, the failure of an electricity grid network, and we've seen a hyper-politicized response around renewable energy, very much in a carbon mitigation kind of mindset and trying to avoid action at at all possible costs. And, and, and the real question there to me seems, why are we not talking about resilient grids? Why is the conversation coming out of that not about uh, the role grids play and how we can change the resilience of our electricity networks, which underpin our essential services uh, within, a, in, within any kind of plausible climate scenario? Um, I don't want to go too much about that. I think the key thing around design life kind of speaks for itself. Our assets are going to see the sorts of um, impacts that we, we, we haven't yet. Um, the question of social license risk uh, from a financial perspective is, is huge. Um, we dodged a bullet last weekend. Um, the Labour government happened to maintain power within the Australian Capital Territory, which was the second example in Australia of the partisan politicisation of infrastructure investment. So we had the Liberal Party going to an election saying, if we win this election, we will can the light rail job. Uh, this followed hot on the heels of uh, the Victorian government, where things tipped the other way. And in that case, a Labour government went to the election committing to abolish a major highway project. Now, from a sustainability perspective, I might really support the abolishment of highway projects, but from an infrastructure investment perspective, this is not a good outcome. And I think, as sustainability professionals, we're kidding ourselves if we believe that it was a win for the environment. Um, it really was a major loss for good governance around investment in infrastructure, which is essential to the work that we in this room are, are trying to get to. So the operating in a framework of a politicized approach to infrastructure, social license becomes critical because being able to tell an effective story to communities about how impacts are managed, uh, how their uh, community uh, as stakeholders, their views are important, their views are listened, that we're on the, the IAP2 spectrum of participation, and also that the environmental aspects around infrastructure are duly considered. Because a lot of the, um, the sort of community response against infrastructure is often on environmental grounds. And we need to be very cognizant of the role that sustainability and a strong sustainability story can play in managing the risk around infrastructure investment. Um, and the third risk item 
that is, that is quite material when we speak about sustainability is the issue of carriage of responsibility or supply chain risk. Because infrastructure projects are incredibly complex. They typically get handed to and fro between private and public players uh, over their life. Um, it could start in a public sector from a planning perspective, get handed over to a DNC contract, get handed back to a public operator. Uh, triple P's complicate that still further. And so we, we live in a, and work in a very current, very Australian environment of complex ownership of the project over its life. Now, complex ownership in the time dimension with complex impacts between different trades, different services, different aspects of design, complex planning process, et cetera, becomes a very difficult thing to track and manage. Uh, how does the end owner have any level of comfort that climate has actually been addressed during planning? Like, there isn't any continuous chain of custody that each person can, well, there is, um, and we'll get there in a minute, but traditionally there hasn't been a chain of custody framework for how we hand responsibility over from planning through to operation. Um, the other considerations around sustainability and, and sustainability frameworks, um, efficiency and governance, uh, there is a, a real benefit in efficiency. Um, unfortunately, again, it comes back to that carriage of responsibility because a lot of the efficiency benefits are actually realized or the inefficiency, in, uh, inefficiency drawbacks are realized by the long-term owner of the asset. Uh, you need some way to connect that to the decision-making of a short-term financier who's doing two years of construction and 12 months of defects after that. Um, and to be honest, they just couldn't give a stuff. Um, they are, they're there for the short term. So how we are able to bring long-term thinking uh, into construction processes. Um, the other area is around integrated design, um, the value that we get out of getting engineers to actually talk to each other um, is extraordinary. Uh, and in the green building space, which is kind of my career path to date, uh, it was all about getting mechanical engineers and electrical engineers to talk to facade engineers. Uh, in the context of a complex infrastructure project going through a community, the levels of integration that are required to effectively manage these risks are beyond what we've traditionally done and are trained to do within our individual delivery sectors. We do not get the levels of training we need to manifest interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary design. It just doesn't exist. What might do now, Andrew, I can't speak for uh, UNIS, oh, Sydney Uni at the moment, but certainly in, in my training, at the University of Cape Town, the idea of working with the architects or working with the electrical engineers was beyond the pale. Uh, so uh, getting a culture of integrated design is critical. And then finally, assurance. Um, we've spoken about branding and benchmarking as these great things in themselves. Look at my wonderful rating. And I'm sure there'll be a little bit of look at my wonderful rating this evening, um, but <laughs> I won't preempt that. Uh, we've kind of, we, we've seen that in the property industry and. And moving beyond that in the infrastructure industry, what we're seeing is that actually the value of independent certification is the value of assurance. It comes back to my reference to KPMG and PwC and Deloitte and Co. before. We're in the business of assuring non-financial performance. We're in the business of measuring it, monitoring it, and providing a level of verification that gives both communities and investors some level of certainty that all of the good news stories the politicians say when they cut the ribbon are actually there in reality in the project. So that for me is the value proposition and that is why getting an assured outcome for sustainability is important. I'm gonna move quite quickly now because I think I'm about to be chased off the stage. We've done some very simple mapping. Um, a lot of the, the questions around ISCA and GRES, we've looked uh, are around the administrative efficiency of it. We've worked and done a, uh, a piece of work that looks at IS 1.2, looks at the GRESB infrastructure survey, and the PRI guidelines for direct infrastructure investment um, by the UN. And we've looked at the overlap between them. And essentially what we get to is that if you look at IS operations, um, it covers 90% of the requirements of the GRESB infrastructure assessment and 75% of the, of the PRI. So by going down an IS ops route, and strategically looking at your other governance questions, you're able to, in quite an integrated way, deal with the assurance and governance issues relating to investment in infrastructure. And you're also able to manage this across the design life and aggregate those results into a fund. And so in combination, the IS operations rating and the GRESB survey provide both um, asset level benchmarking at a delivery level through the project life 
and global peer-to-peer -peer benchmarking of performance, which gives your super fund holders an incredible insight into how and the level to which um, the, your assets, your investments, uh, are insulated against uh, those sorts of risks that I've mentioned already. A um, couple of where to nexts, and I promise I'll be off. Um, spoken to administrative efficiency and the integrated sustainability between them. Where we're short, we're short on quantified value research. Everything I've spoken today is, quali is qualitative. It is climate change has some impacts. Uh, the game changer in property was when we quantified some of the impacts of sustainability and sustainability benchmarking on asset values. I'm not entirely sure what the game changes here will be, but we desperately need to put the time and effort into the research around value. Uh, as we move global, there are serious questions around human rights and corruption, and the global asset flows of a global financial sector expose infrastructure assets to those issues, and they're material to infrastructure. So we need to get onto that. And we need to be able to navigate this private public space. Grezb, and Emke will speak to it in a minute, it still lends itself primarily to, primarily to private investment. Um, but I desperately hope that we get a government level or peer to peer government level of accountability for infrastructure. And on that note, I welcome up my esteemed friend from Holland, Emke, to come and speak to Grezb. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I, I'm afraid I am a minority because I'm not an engineer, I must uh, confess. <laughs> Um, so, uh, th thank you. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit more about uh, the work that we've done uh, uh, with GRASP infrastructure. Um, for those of you who don't know GRASP, uh, GRASP is an organization that, that is committed to uh, sustainability assessments and peer bar benchmarking for real assets globally. Um, we have been active in the real estate market since 2009, um, and we have become uh, yeah, a standard there for, uh, for investors in, in real estate. Um, so we, um, together with a group of, uh, of leading global um, infrastructure investors, we uh, launched GRASP Infrastructure in uh, 2015. Um, these investors, including uh, AMP Capital here in Australia, uh, Ontario Teachers, uh, AIMCO and Kelpers in North America, uh, a couple of European um, members, uh, APG and PTGM in the Netherlands, um, um, Danish, ATP and Pension Denmark, um, um, they, they were involved in this because they saw the need for a global framework for sustainability benchmarking for uh, real estate investments. We, we are not a, a rating uh, scheme or a certification. We do um, peer benchmarking and we produce outputs that investors use in their engagement process uh, with, their with their investments on ESG. Um, We developed uh, three core competencies for infrastructure. Uh, first of all, we do a systematic assessment of infrastructure funds and assets. Um, we do objective scoring and, um, and, and we do peer benchmarking. So what we try to do is comparing uh, toll roads to toll roads and, 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 and solar farms to solar farms. We, we cover a broad range of, uh, of infrastructure sectors. Um, GRASP infrastructure um, uh, focuses on, uh, on, on infrastructure funds and infrastructure assets. Um, we focus on operational infrastructure assets uh, mainly. Um, we do not focus on, uh, on the project level yet, so we, we, um, we, we, we focus on Heathrow airports uh, and not one of the runways. Um, so we have a fund assessment, which is a very basic uh, assessment uh, cons uh, consisting of 10 indicators. Um, and funds that participate in the fund assessment will re receive a score. A very important part of the score um, is based on the performance of the underlying assets that participate in the asset assessment. A 70% weight uh, is allocated to uh, those asset scores. <clears throat> 
Um, the asset assessment is a more detailed assessment. It, it, it consists of uh, 32 indicators uh, covering eight aspects. Um, as I mentioned, we cover a broad range of business activities, uh, including energy, uh, water resource management, waste, transportation, and, and the social infrastructure, and, and a lot of uh, subsectors uh, underlying those uh, main categories. Um, yeah, I already mentioned, we focused most on operational infrastructure in the first year, and, and uh, most participants were really, really like uh, a corporate structure operating companies uh, with yeah, personnel, policies, etc. in place. Um, the eight aspects that we cover uh, include management, policy and disclosure, uh, uh, risks and opportunities, but also a very important um, aspect that we cover in our assessment is performance indicators. We, it, it is reflected in the relatively high weight of 30%. Because we believe that um, effective management policy is the foundation, but um, yeah, that, that, that we, we need real action and, and, and performance because that will make the difference. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the first GRASP infrastructure assessment uh, that took place in 2016. So funds and assets could participate in this assessment uh, from April to July. Um, then we closed our uh, online portal and we, um, uh, we spent a lot of time on, on validation of all uh, responses and, and on scoring. And we recently released our first results on, uh, on October 11th. So in the first year, we had 185 participants. 51 of those participants were infrastructure funds, and 134 were infrastructure assets. Um, all those participants were, um, were uh, spread over 53 uh, countries globally. Um, most participants were based in Europe, uh, 73 in total. Uh, we had 38 North American assets, and uh, Australia and New Zealand had 21 assets that participated in the first year. Um, if we look at business activities, you see that we, uh, we had 29 renewable energy assets, 15 conventional energy, um, 17 social infrastructure, uh, and a lot of transport assets, including eight airports, seven ports, and eight toll roads. We had also energy transmission and distribution participants. We had communications infrastructure. We had um, uh, district heating, uh, and also some diversified assets. Um, so for each category where we have enough um, uh, participants, we have been able to, to come up with a, a dedicated peer group for that um, sector. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of the, the highlights uh, of, of the results because um, um, yeah, I don't have to, enough time to, uh, to provide the details, but um, uh, we have a very nice report and you can, uh, you can read that to, to get all the insights. Um, this chart plots um, all participants and, and we, uh, we uh, map them based on management and policy performance and implementation and measurement performance. Um, and what you see here is that um, there's a, a wide dispersion in results in the first year. The average scores that S has achieved is 28 out of 100. There are quite some regional differences. So the, the best performers uh, had an average score of 43, and those were assets that were diversified over region. Well, not surprisingly, especially not for, for, for uh, this audience here today, is that the Australian assets were the best performers. Uh, the Australian assets had an average score of 35. So uh, yeah, this really... Uh, reflects that, that ESG, ESG management is, is most mature in the most mature uh, infrastructure market. If we look at the, the um, average scores uh, per aspect that achieved, we can see that, um, uh, that the infrastructure assets are generally on track with uh, embedding ESG management in their organizations. 
this is reflected in high scores for management, uh, for policy and disclosure. Um, not a lot of assets, however, could report uh, on performance indicators um, or on project level uh, uh, certifications and, and, and awards. So that maybe has to do with the fact that we fo focus on uh, operational assets uh, mostly, uh, but we also think that there is a, yeah, a lot of work uh, to be done. Um, so the performance indicators that, uh, that most uh, participants that could report on that uh, reported on is um, as health and safety that that we see that across all business activities. Um, if we look at the um, uh, environmental indicators uh, that are in our assessments, uh, there were a couple of um, um, uh, points that we found. Uh, first of all, more than half of the participants have um, included environmental elements in, 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 into their uh, policies. Um, so energy was um, uh, the environmental uh, element which was most often uh, covered. Um, but also the other uh, environmental elements had, had a relatively good coverage. If we look at risk assessments, we also see that a lot of participants approximately have had um, uh, environmental uh, elements part of their risk assessments. Um, but, but again, if we look at performance indicators, uh, there, there, there was not a lot of uh, coverage. It's, uh, approximately half of the participants could uh, report on energy use, but only a very low percentage could could report on uh, water use, for instance, uh, and, and biodiversity of habitats. So, um, yeah, to conclude, there, there, there's a lot to be done. Uh, policies, um, um, assets are on track there. Uh, they, they have uh, leadership uh, dedicated to ESG, uh, but, but there really needs to be, uh, is, there really is a lot of work to be done uh, on, on measuring. Um, a couple of points on the, uh, the, on the Australian market. So we had 21 Australian participants. Um, eight of those were transportation assets. Uh, four airports um, out of the global eight uh, airports that participated, two ports and two toll roads. We also had seven Australian social infrastructure assets, uh, three energy, and trans energy transmission and distribution assets and one renewable energy asset. As I mentioned, scores were, uh, were on average higher than, than for assets on the other continents, but there were a couple of um, um, aspects in our assessments that Australian assets performed very uh, good on. That's uh, risk and opportunities. The average score there was uh, 50 versus uh, the global average of 31. Um, also, a lot of um, uh, Australian assets had um, uh, environmental management uh, systems in place. The average score there was 57 uh, as compared to the global average of 39. And also, uh, stakeholder engagement what was, was one of the elements where the Australian assets performed really well. Uh, Australian assets had a slightly lower score on um, the reporting and measuring of, uh, of performance indicators. So, um, what's next for GRASP infrastructure? We, we, we were happy with uh, participation in the first year, but to really have uh, good quality data uh, and to do good uh, global uh, peer benchmarking, we need uh, a lot more assets to participate. Um, so, we, we are actively consulting right now with, um, with our participants uh, that participated in 2016, our members, and with industry experts to further uh, develop our assessments to, to make it ready for 2017. Um, we are also actively reaching out to, um, uh, to potential um, new participants and members that, that would like to get involved in this. Um, so the focus this year was on operational assets, uh, and, and most assets were privately held. Um, but we also um, would like to diversify that, that, that asset, base, uh, of asset base of participants a little bit, uh, and also target uh, listed investments um, 
uh, and, and, and greenfield uh, investments. Um, so we published our results in a report that can be found on our website, which is www.grasp.com. Um, and we're publishing some um, follow-up research within the next couple of months. And, and one of the areas that we will focus on is the uh, differences between the different infrastructure sectors. So, um, yeah, I, um, I all uh, encourage you to, to check out the report and our website and, um, uh, and get involved. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer them.